Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Steve Scherer. I'm the Chief of Research at the Hospital for Sick Children. And we're in the third edition of the Discovery Dialogue Speaker Series, which today brings together the brightest minds to discuss the research and their path to scientific discovery. Today, we are so pleased to welcome Dr. Lauren Tyrell. He's the Distinguished University Professor at the University of Alberta and founding director of the Li Ka Shing Institute of Virology. Dr. Tyrell is best known for his pioneering work on the basic science and clinical development of new therapeutics for hepatitis B, as well as COVID-19 vaccine development efforts in Canada. He is visiting Toronto today as part of the 2021 Henry G. Friesen International Prize in Health Research Award Lecture hosted by the Friends of CIHR. And he presented this morning at Massey College, and then also this uh, earlier, um, just a few hours ago in our auditorium here at the Peter Gilligan Centre for Research and Learning to a much broader audience of students and trainees. So, um, Lauren, uh, welcome to Sick Kids. It's very, very great to have you here. And um, I wonder if you could just begin by telling us a little bit about your background, where you're from, your upbringing, and what led you into science and how, how you ended up here today in, in a few minutes or less. <laughs> a few minutes or less, yeah. Let me just say that I was born and raised on a farm in uh, Alberta. Uh, just west of Edmonton, it was a mixed farm, and actually it gives you a pretty good background for some of the things you face in research and solving problems. You had to do a lot of that in the farming industry as well. But um, I was in a family of six children and first to go off to university and uh, at the University of Alberta where I completed a degree in chemistry, BSc in chemistry, and was fortunate that year to win the gold medal in science. Um, from there, I went into medicine, thinking I would be a family physician in rural Alberta. But in my second year of medicine, I won an MD, PhD scholarship from uh, insurance in New York. And I ended up uh, changing my career uh, in a major way. And so I did my MD, followed by a PhD at Queen's with Jerry Marks, and then came back, trained in internal medicine, infectious diseases. Fell in love with viruses uh, when I was going through that and ended up doing a postdoc at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm mm -hmm. with Erwin Norby. So you're an MD, PhD by training. Yes. And um, <clears throat> in one of your talks this morning, you showed this really interesting Venn diagram where you have the, the, the overlap of what you call the Discovery Institute <clears throat> and also a translational institute as part of the Li Ka-Shing Institute. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about your ideas around uh, discovery as, it, as they're involved in translation. Well, I think one of the real <coughs> things that is an advantage of being an MD, PhD is you really do see the issues with patients. And you bring them back often to basic scientists who haven't had the chance to see what are the key issues. And I really felt all the time that uh, being in both camps is very important. I have, in my basic science work, I've worked a lot with very good basic scientists and collaboration, but often bring back what is the key problem we need to look at here. And that's the advantage of getting both an MD, PhD. I think you are a very important role working with the basic scientists and bringing highlights to them of what we should be looking at. What is the key problem? Right. Um, I did some research. You published hundreds and hundreds of papers. And I remember your 1991 PNAS paper. Is that is that one of your top discovery papers? You oh, talked think, about it this morning. Yeah, no, I think that was a, a very important paper, and it was a had a very good student working in the lab at that time. And uh, it was a critical paper because it showed us that uh, we were often puzzled why would some of the dideoxys be very effective, DDG, in the hip in the inhibition of hepatitis B, but not other dioxys and we realized that somehow they had to be proofread out and the first nucleotide attached to the protein of the primer protein was always the oxyguanosine so we knew that bond wasn't being broken but others downstream were and that PNAS paper really illustrated to us that with pyrophosphate in the reaction you could reverse the DNA polymerase and do proofreading and of course the other part of that paper is that there's a very small volume, and I think we don't think enough about compartmentalization 
that goes on in the cytoplasm when you're seeing a virus replicate like this. So when you <clears throat> conceptualize the kind of content for that paper, the experiments, did that come to you in the middle of the night or was it incremental? What was the background there? Uh, it was incremental, I think. Uh, we, you know, we, we knew that dinoxiguanosine was the most important inhibitor and we knew that it was binding to the primer protein. But we still didn't know why hepatitis B had some ability to proofread. And we did some studies on showing the rate of synthesis of DNA in the presence in the hepatitis B virus. And it was slower, about uh, one seventh as fast as we would have expected. And we wondered why it was slower. And then we got into the idea of compartmentalization and the pyrophosphate in that there was the uh, virus actually the replicating core it's got a lot of lysines in it that uh, sort of keeps the pyrophosphate in there. And it really ended up as an ideal environment inside the virus to do proofreading. And that paper was the critical one to show us it can proofread. Amazing. So I have to say, um, I've known your name forever, <laughs> but as, as an individual who sat on boards and uh, more, most recently on the vir viral task force and things, and, and I think that's a, a the same for many people in Toronto. In fact, a few people walking away from your seminar this morning said, man, he knows his nucleotide chemistry. <laughs> um, and, and you made a comment uh, at Mass Ecology this morning, which really stuck with me, and that was, you, you, you really need to know your science to, to plan the experiments and to communicate and to teach. And, and always to stay on top of your science, even if you're communicating with politicians about what's important and what's not. And I wonder if you can just comment on how long in your career you stayed really close to the science where you were still doing experiments or conceptualizing ideas, it seems like right up until today, but tell us more well, about that. Well, yeah, no, I, uh, one of the, I, I did take on some leadership positions, you know, as a chair, it's a, leadership position, but uh, as the Dean of Medicine, that was the most critical time for me because I, I made all the, a, a table saying, why should you be Dean? Why should you not be Dean? And unfortunately for my research, why I should not be Dean was quite a bit longer. Right. However, uh, I did try to protect some time while I was Dean that I got back into the lab to know what was going on in the lab and to direct some of the things in the lab. And uh, I've made that uh, important to spend some time in the lab as much as I can. And uh, that's just to keep me informed and uh, to help formulate what we're going to do. And I still find that as a clinician scientist, there are unique aspects you bring to that discussion with the basic scientists and people working in your lab. Having the clinical aspects, the patient problems that you know about is very, very important. <clears throat> and I think that's important for you know, when I bring politicians up to the Li Kaixing, I did put a little display play and, and point it out to them that, you know, <clears throat> we as basic scientists just don't play in the lab. We're trying to find solutions to problems. And we show them five different things that people working in the Institute have been involved in uh, bringing to patient benefit. Of course, the number one is Michael Houghton's work in the papers discovering the hepatitis C virus that he published at the same time with the diagnostic test for hepatitis C. Right. Critically important to Canadians, and they understand that very well, the politicians. Here's the tainted blood problem, here's the virus discovered, and here's the test to show you. But we do that with hepatitis B, and we do it with several other things. Just they understand that we're trying to bring products to benefit patients. Um, that brings me to my next kind of question or, or idea. Um, Again, your, your talk really had a lot of impact uh, on people thinking about science, really in its most basic terms, and, and in this case, applying it to, to virology and COVID. So um, it had a great impact today. When you're thinking about developing your career, um, I want to kind of dig into, uh, there's a neurologist who trained with me very early in my career, and he said something to me. Uh, it was, you know, I can see patients and have impact on a patient one at a time, because they see them one at a time. If you do science and make a discovery, you can change the world or you can impact entire populations. And here at SickKids, a lot of the, um, the conditions we study are rare diseases. About 70% of the kids who come here have a genetic disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, often they're rare. 
And uh, so we're having impact maybe at the family level or groups and patients, for example. Your big discoveries and contributions impacted the world, hepatitis. I'm curious, did what was your entry point? How did you think about that? Did you just follow your nose or did you plan to have well, big, big impact? No, that's a good question. But, you know, I had this interest in hepatitis ever since I'd seen uh, how the, the virus replicated. And I wanted to work on it. And initially, we didn't have the tools. But uh, when the duck virus was uh, out, you could replicate the virus in a cell culture system. You suddenly had the tools, you could work on it. I had begun to see, as I mentioned, I began to see patients with hepatitis. And I could see that we were doing so little for them. And it actually was interesting because uh, it's a disease in many, mostly in third world countries. And, mm -hmm. and it wasn't a big, even when I went to Glaxo and we started talking about this, they said, is there enough patients with hepatitis B in, in North America and Western Europe? And I said, I am sure there are. And they said we needed uh, six weeks to have a look ourselves to see if it was really something we want to get into. And they came back in two weeks and said, yeah, there is a problem here. And it's an unmet medical need and uh, you may have some uh, into helping these patients. So we will support you. And that was critical. And I think that's the difference when you're a clinician scientist as to a scientist. Most scientists may not have realized how much problem. But when you sit in a clinic and you see patients and I had some patients that I followed during that period that I could see them deteriorate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're dressed and on, they would develop a hepatoma or they would develop cirrhosis and need a, a transplant. And what really got me is when the transplant team decided not to transplant patients with hep B, I suddenly realized some of the patients that were falling were being shut out in that area. So I was keen to see if we could put some therapy for hepatitis B and I did some early studies with adenine arabinicide, uh, one of the early antivirals for DNA viruses, but it wasn't that successful. But uh, when we started looking at uh, dioxynucleosides, and then from there getting Glaxo involved, I knew we were on the right track. So one of the other things you commented on today was collaboration, and you mentioned uh, building from your own contributions, of course. Uh, some of the great names in Canadian science, I think, yeah. certainly in the last few years. And I'll just throw a few out there, but I'd like to hear some of your comments on um, maybe some unique traits or characteristics or observations that these people working with you may have made. Uh, you mentioned Peter Cullis, who won the Gardner International Award this year for his work uh, on the vaccine. Uh, Ian McLaughlin, Frank Graham, the HEC 293 yeah. story, which was fascinating. Who are your favorites? And t tell us, tell the, the audience something they don't know. <laughs> well, I think that uh, Peter Collins has uh, been very persistent in his work with the how you deliver uh, either sRNA or uh, messenger RNA uh, in the nanoparticle system. And that's had a lot of growth. I mean, uh, I looked, I did some work with Ian very early on in Tecmera. We were trying to deliver some of the sRNAs for some of the genes and hepatitis B. But I, I've seen these people working on the uh, nanotechnology delivery systems. And uh, it, it was a long, long period and not easy. And they persisted and came up with the answers in the end that were critically important to this. So there was a major contribution from that whole group in uh, UBC and uh, Canadian science made a big contribution to these vaccines. I, I had the pleasure of seeing Peter um, present to the Canadian Genetic Disease Network when I was a PhD student. I'm thinking it was probably early 1990s and, yeah. and we, we all walked out of there, including the, the Michael Haydens who were there and Lapchi Choi's and Ron Wharton just walked out saying, you know, we don't know what he's talking about. There's no application here. <laughs> and to see, I was so happy to see that the, you know, this is what basic science can deliver on. And you, you gave many other examples. Tell us a little bit about your uh, the influence of trainees on your career. Well, I've had some trainees that have made huge impacts on my career. Um, critically important. I mean, you know, anybody that runs a lab knows that 
a lot of the major contributions are made by key individuals in the lab that come up with a comment or an observation. And it's usually the vitality of your lab is based on still having young trainees that bring the uh, new ideas. When I was the Dean of Medicine, I would go to faculty meetings and sometimes come away a little bit perplexed on how we're going to go forward. All I needed to do is spend an hour or two with the students and I would realize the future is in good hands. They're in the right direction. And I think that's true in labs. The key students in my lab was, uh, I had some very good students that made uh, Sin Urban was uh, someone that did the work on the pyrophosphorolysis and uh, you know, was an excellent student. Uh, he was a, a gold medalist in science and uh, made great contribution to my lab. I had some technicians that made great contributions uh, in the early days setting up Anita Lee. We did a lot of the dot plots and it, it took a little bit of uh, talent to get these to look right and make them beautiful. And uh, they were great people that made very significant contribution to my lab. Uh, followed by the name of Carl Fisher, who was a technician, a student technician, and uh, he made some nice observations and helped us with dealing with the resistance to lamivudine and the key paper on how lamivudine resistance develops and how this was going to be a problem. And we made the predictions before we ever saw it in the patient, and, but it was a very accurate pre prediction that this would be a problem. So students have made tremendous contributions. Um, I, I know a lot about the history of biochemistry research at the uh, University of Alberta and Edmonton and, and other areas. And you know, tell us, tell us, we're, we're sitting in downtown Toronto, and some people say that Toronto thinks they're the center of the science universe. <laughs> and sick kids, we think, are right at the center, maybe sometimes. But tell us about science and research in Alberta. You've done so well. You've got the, the institute, and, and what do you think about you know, what are we doing right? What are we? What do we need to do better in Canada? Well, I think you know, there's no doubt that uh, at one time. You know, the University of Alberta had a pretty strong reputation and it evolved originally in chemistry, it was strong, then it went into biochemistry. Right now, I think that microbiology and medical microbiology and uh, immunology are strong, but it is key people. And, you know, Alberta benefited so much from the Alberta Heritage Foundation for Medical Research. I was always very destroyed by the idea that this should be continued. Mm -hmm. Had it continued, I think we would still have a lot of strengths that we unfortunately lost some of those. But the biochemistry, with John Coulter in the early days of biochemistry, the Cyril Kays. Cyril Kay has been probably my mentor as oh. I was dean and as I go through many things. I often sit down and have a coffee with Cyril or meet with Cyril, have dinner with Cyril, and you know, he's now 90, and his mind is just as alert as it was when he was... This is Lewis's father? Lewis's father, yes. yes. Yep. An example of both father and son winning uh, Orders of Canada mm -hmm. and officers of the Order of Canada, so wonderful. And you also trained at uh, Karolinska. I trained in the Karolinska, and I was privileged of working in Erlen Norby's lab. Erlen is... Uh, was on the Nobel Committee, chaired the Nobel Committee for a number of years, and uh, I had the privilege of attending the Nobel ceremonies in 1976 when Carlton Gottesek and uh, uh, Bloomberg won the Nobel Prize for unusual viruses. So uh, last year I also won uh, from the American uh, Hepatitis B Association the Bloomberg Prize uh, this recent year, so it's been very nice. It's been a wonderful year. And how important was that, you know, getting this early exposure in your career? I think it's critical yeah. for people to get early exposure to good science and to help develop and make key decisions in their careers. And you're trying to do that with students that you're training as well. But that type of exposure is important. So the, the average age now of starting uh, you know, kind of a basic research lab for a PhD, I think it's 36, 37, an MD, PhD, maybe 39. And we, we had we had lunch with a bunch of students today, which was great. We're giving them exposure to this yeah. icon of Canadian science. Um, but it was, you know, we talked about their careers. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's too late. I think there's too 
we are too rigid in our training programs. And uh, it's good to have the discipline and get in a good lab, but, you know, we drag some of them on too long. And I think we need to graduate them younger and give them more freedom. Right. I really do think that uh, when the PhD starts his own lab at 30, 35, 35 or 36, should be six, seven years earlier if you can possibly do it. I agree. That's my thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you're um, on your tour from the Henry Friesen Prize this week, and we're working them real hard. <laughs> it is. This is. Uh, you want to just comment maybe on some of the previous winners? We were with Alan Bernstein this morning, and wow. there are so many icons in the previous winners. But uh, you know, David Naylor and what he's done for Canadian science and how he's tried to work so much with government and so very actively with government to increase uh, support for Canadian science. I think that uh, Alan Bernstein is uh, another outstanding Canadian who has worked well in trying to be a diplomat in how you get involved with uh, policy makers and science leaders and decisions in Canada. We need people like David and Alan uh, Janet Rassam, uh, so many people have been very critical that have won this award before and how they have uh, helped science in Canada. In your talk this morning, you had this beautiful slide where you showed the, um, I think it was the first detection of SARS-CoV-2 and the genome sequence coming a month later and, yes. and then vaccine within the same calendar year. Yes. And you, you, you commented on the role of discovery in that. Can you just tell the audience a little bit more about this? Well, you know, everybody thinks that the COVID vaccines, the MR vaccines are, the, the vaccine doubters and the anti-vaxxers will tell you it's all done too quick and it's new and it's not tested. But in fact, there's 20 to 30 years of critical basic science that was going on with mRNA and trying to find out how to stabilize it, how to prevent the innate immune response, critical discoveries that led up to us being in a position, or for them to be in a position, to rapidly transfer these labs from developing vaccines against cancer to, or as an example, to vaccines against the virus. But the technology was developed over 20 years, not over, it's not sudden. But the technology is so good that they can develop vaccines and get them through clinical trials in a year. That may be with different regulation in the future when we need in a uh, pandemic situation like this, it could be down to even shorter times. So it's new technology. It's a, it's a win for science, a big win for science in the world. And I'm just so sad that there is so much publicity through the uh, publicity against some of the science and anti vaxxers etc. Um, you whispered in my ear just before lunch, which was music to my ears, that you thought the next big breakthroughs were coming in cancer and neurological disease. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, no. I'm, <laughs> Tell well, us something you know, we should be doing here. I think that, uh, you know, if you look at, it's been a long struggle in cancer, and particularly in solid tumors. Mm -hmm. And I think we're coming to the time you can see major breakthroughs and it'll involve some of the technologies we're talking about now and how they can really change uh, the outcomes of cancers. And I think that we're on the verge the next 10 years to see a lot of those solid tumors getting very much better results than did. And neurology was an interesting area because neurology, uh, certainly <coughs> We were good at making diagnosis, or we had pretty good diagnosis based mainly on clinical and some uh, advances in technology, but not so good in developing therapies. Right. But I see what's happening with this type of technology we're developing, the opportunity to now look at therapies in some of these neurological diseases that were, it was really unthought of before. We just didn't think we could get there. I think we are going to get there. I mean, your work on autism is wonderful work and for the patients that have autism i think the sick kids is the world and cystic fibrosis autism these are clear examples that canadians should be so proud of we we um we actually um 
as an institution have been thinking about uh, using some of the technologies from the mRNA vaccination for delivering to do experiments, basic biology, but also in delivery. And, and we couldn't yeah. even envision these things a few years ago now. So it, no. you're right, it's a different world. And, and I, it, I think you're right also. Cancer, neurology, and most neurogenetic diseases are single gene disorders. So you just have to kind of impact one gene or one protein. And yeah, have, you can and have a huge, huge impact. impact. So I, I think that's going to happen in neurological diseases, and it'll be just an exciting next uh, 15, 20 years in neurology and cancer. So both of them are going to have major advances. So when you were, you know, early in your career back in the lab, pipetting and probably mouth pipetting. And <laughs> Did you yeah. ever think you'd be at a stage where you'd be on the on the national vaccine task force, communicating with the prime minister's office and advisors? And uh, t tell tell the audience a little bit. I was I was enthralled by your description of how they listened. Well, it that? was. I, I think the vaccine task force was such an important experience for us because of the urgency of the situation that both government listened and we really felt we were communicating with government and how we would try to get vaccines in place for Canadians quickly. And, you know, as I said, I've been on other committees, we write a report, you hand in the report, you don't know if it's going to be acted on or not, and often it collects dust and you wish that uh, people had listened to. This was different. We had government people listening to us debating on how we come to our decisions. And we wrote advice letters based on those discussions. And they went directly to govern people who could take the action. And that was a very different experience than anything I'd been on before. And it made the vaccine task force just fun to be with and fun to have. So, uh, yeah, that was critical and important. Did you throw any kind of nucleotide chemistry at them in, <laughs> in the reports as payback? No, I mean, <laughs> it would be wrong. You know, I, I learned my nucleotide chemistry. <laughs> And most of this from good chemists that right. are in the Lee Kai Shing, Dr. Houghton has brought in a number of people that are very good chemists. He understands the importance of chemistry, the importance of, he understands the issue of bringing substances to products. And uh, he heads up our Applied Virology Institute. And of course, U of A got a big base boost yeah. from recruiting Michael Houghton and then for Michael to win the Nobel Prize. Yeah, in 2020, 2020 was it? 2020, yeah. it, he shared it with uh, Charlie Rice, a very good virologist that worked in hepatitis C, and Harvey Alter who was a clinician scientist at the NIH, and Michael yeah. shared the prize. Incredible. Um, we actually have a few guests in the audience here, and I'm wondering if anybody wanted to ask any questions. Yeah, you know, the, this, 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 the design here is for those of you from Toronto it, it is after Moses Nimer's speaker's corner. So just kind of now yeah. jump in. We have Mike Tyers here. Mike, you want to yes. come up and ask, get on the yeah. video? Oh, I, oh, I, right. I should I'll introduce just, Mike's a new I'll scientist. Uh, so <laughs> Lord knows I always ask a question. Yes. Um, and uh, I, just, I want to ask you a policy question with all of your work on the vaccine tax task force and, and over many decades in Canada. How are you feeling about political engagement of the scientific community with with politicians and government? And as you know, we're you know we're, we've been facing this um, kind of incremental decay in support for yeah. for science, and and I see it as a huge issue for our younger generation of scientists. I think it's a major issue, and uh, we have to scientists have to become more active, and we have to educate the public, and that should start. You know, I was thinking about how you do this, and you really do start when kids are in elementary school and the importance of science. I remember giving a talk on hepatitis B to a grade five students. Um, my son was in there and asked if I would talk, and I ended up going talk. I was shocked. I was shocked because we talked, and I was supposed to be 15 minutes. It went longer than that because of the questions these kids were asking. And it was through their Recess break. They stayed and asked questions. And they asked questions that were better than I would get from most students other places. So, if, you know, kids at an early age pick it up. And I want to say how you change things in this world. When I started in medicine, I walked into the doctor's room and it would be blue with smoke. 
everybody, a lot of the doctors smoked. You couldn't imagine that today. And you, you start with young kids and you change their behavior and their thoughts, and that's gonna change. And we need to do more about the importance of science in our life and in our policies and in our politics. Science has to be supported. That's how we have to make the decision. One of the tough parts is many people think science is a straight line and easy. It's not a straight line. It is variable and there are, just as we've seen in COVID, the recommendations at one point may not be correct as we learn more science, but that's what science is. And you have to be able to adjust according to the science. And people have to understand that we're all learning at the same time and be patient with a, a little bit, but science has to be the basis of policy the science has to be the basis of discover, discovery science is the basis of innovation and commercialization and our economy. And you know, the United States did a great job for many years of uh, in, in investment in science that had a huge impact on their country. China and India are doing the same thing. And we're seeing more and more outstanding science coming out of those areas. And that's going to have an effect on their economies the same way. We have to maintain our investment and understanding of the importance of investment in science as we go forward. And I don't think anything illustrates it better than the pandemic. We have to be ready for the next pandemic. We can't afford another pandemic being unprepared. Can, can you just expand on that a bit? Because it came up several times today. Uh, how important it is that we stay prepared and you mentioned already the role of scientists but uh, you also compared it to be uh, of equal importance to the environment in, in a way they're linked right? well they're linked but what i really was talking about is climate change has become part of what we all do now we think about um, and you know politicians think about some of them unfortunately negative and deniers of it, but it really is. We can see what's happening with climate and look at the scientists and the predictions and what we need to do. But we need to have that same type of commitment to pandemics. We've been very lucky. We had a pandemic in 1918, 1919. We have this pandemic and it's been a hundred years. However, another pandemic is certainly possible within a shorter, much shorter period. And it could be much more severe than what we've had already. And we have the technology now. We have the technology and we're developing fast that we can do a lot in pandemic preparedness. I think what we need to look at is how we cooperate between industry, government, and academia, but also how we cooperate between countries, come up with the ability to stockpile some of the things we need to really be pandemic ready, both vaccines and antivirals that we could develop now, knowing what are the likely targets for the next pandemic. You saw in 2018, the predictions of what would be the next pandemic caused by and how accurate they were. But we can still do that. And we can still make those predictions. And there's a number of viruses or antimicrobial resistance or whatever you want to look at. There are ways we can do it, but we've got technologies now that can move it much faster. You've got it here, sick kids, what you're doing in autism, we can do in pandemic preparedness. And that's how we need to go forward. Are there any other questions? Yeah, please. We have a few more minutes. Just introduce yourself. Um, that is Palania. Nice to meet you. Greetings and uh, thank you for the great uh, presentation. So this is, um, when one talks about these highly toxic compounds, you know, then you worry about you know, how you can translate, but then you did translate the dioxy compound. Uh, and then how the genotoxicity is uh, dealt with uh, uh, in the treatment? How is the toxicity dealt with? Right. Yeah, well, you know, it was surprising that uh, there is the ability to proofread uh, in DNA very nicely so that even though these compounds looked like they would be toxic, they were not that toxic. And the cell has a great ability to adapt and to uh, deal with them. The virus, in this case, could not do the same thing. And the key thing in the hepatitis B was that 
the protein priming, the first nucleotide attached to this was deoxyguanosine, that doesn't happen in our RNA or our DNA synthesis. So that it was a unique target within the virus. And the more we learn about viruses, the more we see that there are some unique targets that we can uh, directly find ways to inhibit. So, you know, if you just see what's happened with correct acting antivirals and hepatitis C and HIV, without vaccines and those two, we are have the ability to treat almost everybody with those diseases. Now, it's harder because we still have to seek, test, find, and treat. And that's a very big part of going forward. And if you have a vaccine, you can develop. Uh, that is very important. I would like to say that vaccines, we think of as preventing. We do want to see them prevent, but they can also modify uh, your immune system enough that modifies the outcome. And we're seeing people infected who have been fully vaccinated for COVID, but they have a much milder outcome. And that's an important aspect of vaccines as well. And Dr. Houghton uh, and our institute is developing a hep C vaccine that will not necessarily prevent infection, but may modify the immune system so most of those people who are infected become clear of the virus because they've been exposed. And uh, not necessarily that they won't be infected, but they'll have a much better outcome. Great. Thank you. I think for the time. Um, thank you so much. I have one more science question that we can wrap up. Um, you know, I'm a geneticist by training, and I think a lot about genetic diseases and mutations and things. And um, you're a biochemist, virologist. <laughs> yeah. um, you consider, so we think a lot about genes and environment. And, I've struggled in the last few years. Is is the viral insult a genetic insult or is it environmental? And how, how do you think about that? It can be both, of course. It can be both, but I think it's more an environmental insult than a genetic insult. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are a few viruses that actually get, you know, HIV is a perfect example. It is a, a genetic insult as well as a environmental insult. But most of them, I think, are more environmental insults than they are today. Right. So can we can we lump the, the virus into trying to maintain our environment better? And Well, I think we can. <laughs> uh, I think there probably is ways that uh, we will see. And, and of course, some of the properties of viruses are being used by geneticists to try to find ways that we can modify genes and things. Very, very important. Oh, well, so let's um, I give you the chance to make a few predictions here. You made some already, but can you can you predict what what science is going to look like of five years out? Uh, well, like I think there will be as a result of this. My concern, if I have a biggest concern, it's what I call vaccine fatigue. It's not anti-vaxxers or vaccine hesitancy. The people are just tired and the idea that pandemic preparedness may fall into the category of fatigue and we won't be prepared as we should have. I hope that there's enough people who realize, including government, that pandemic preparedness is very different to what we used to think and we have the ability to be well prepared for the next one if we do it right. So that's that area. I used to think that uh, the toughest areas in medicine were solid tumor oncology and neurology. And uh, we are seeing real progress in both of those areas. And I would predict in the next five to 10 years, we'll see dramatic improvements in some tumor therapies. And we will see therapies evolving into neurological disease that we used to diagnose and think there was nothing we could do. I'm trusting in you people and your type of work, Steve, that. Uh, will see us actually get into therapies that will help with these diseases. And last question, um, you know, you've been in the scientific endeavor for 50 years or so. What, what's been the biggest discovery for you? And, it, and you can say your own work too. <laughs> but oh, what was, it, what was oh. the biggest game changer, one or two? Or... Well, in my career, I have seen a number of viral diseases. And as I mentioned this morning in the lecture, uh, to see real surprises in medicine. I mean, I held on to retractors in surgery for ulcer disease 
I was convinced, like everybody else, that ulcer disease was a disease of stress and vagus nerve needed to be cut and all of this. Barry Marshall's accidental finding, because he was looking at biopsies from the stomach and he was going to a cricket game and he put those biopsies on PA blood auger plates, right. left them for four days and come back and there was a film of bacteria around each of the biopsies. And he discovered this was Helicobacter pylorus and he wondered if it caused ulcers and in fact, it did. Dramatic change in how we practice. And I said, there's 1% of the ulcer surgery that we used to have, we do today. Uh, it really has dramatically changed it. I've seen AIDS when it started, and every patient we knew when made the diagnosis, they died, usually within one to two years. And to see those patients now live practically normal lives uh, is a dramatic change for me. And I think the what we've seen in hepatitis C, where we couldn't see any therapy. And in hepatitis B, I wish we could cure them. We can treat them and suppress their progression of their disease, but they stay on therapy. But there's many areas in medicine. You know, when you see, when you saw what happened with uh, CAT scans, MRIs, and I lived in the era that we used to do, pneumoencephalograms and other things to try to diagnose neurological disease, to see how they can be diagnosed with such accuracy, so quickly, and so precisely, uh, minimum discomfort to the patients. Dramatic changes. Well, um, any closing comments? <laughs> You've covered it all. No, I think that uh, it's still the most exciting career as uh, medicine, and if you can combine research with actually seeing patients. I think that makes it even more fun. And uh, never forget how much I learn from patients when I'm seeing those patients. And they give you clues. Uh, when I was flying out here, I sat next to a family from a mother and a father, I mean a brother and a son from uh, Anuvan in the Cambridge Bay. They were coming to see their father who in the summer, this summer, was still functioning completely normal. He is now demented in two months and in an institution in Ottawa. And his uncle has gone through the same thing. I just say to myself, patients teach us so much and give us such clues. Why is this? He's 58 years old. Two months ago, according to both of them, he was well. And how can you be meant that quickly? And what is doing it? Right. Clear messages from patients that we need to find better ways. Could be genetic, could be viral. Could, could be, be either. Both. Yeah. Um, but the, those are the types of things that happen when you're seeing in clinical practice, say, we need to follow that and find out. And, and how long did, in your career did you see patients? I saw patients right up until uh, just before COVID. I, decided that I was going to uh, stop seeing patients, continue in my lab. Uh, I've got a birthday coming up that's a, a fairly major birthday, and I, <laughs> I, I took the belief that it's better to, to step away from patients one day early than rather one day late. Right. right. It was at the point of my career that I thought I should uh, take some time for retirement. And uh, we can go on forever. Um, you also mentioned <laughs> I'm going to go on forever. Uh, you you think you saw the first HIV patient in Canada? Well, I think I saw one of the probably the one first. of the very earliest, and it was in a patient that was with uh, Pacific Western Airlines, and he was a flight engineer, and involved in flying into Zaire of some heavy equipment on a contract, and the airport was closed, and the plane ran out of fuel and crashed. And he was a lone survivor of six of them in the plane, but he fractured his leg. And he did, two years later, present in a clinic with very severe candidiasis all the way through his esophagus, weight loss. And uh, we didn't know what he had, but we did uh, try to find out. And I knew that his T cell function had disappeared and he had opportunistic infections and we were trying to figure it out. And in my practice, when I saw patients, I used to put a bit of blood away in case you found out something later that might help you. And in that case, it was 1976, and 
78, he passed away. In 83, I sent his blood to the CDC when HIV was discovered and he was positive. Wow. So. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Uh, as you heard, much of um, the recent history of scientific advances, both from discovery and translation, are linked to this gentleman here, <laughs> either directly or dotted line. Um, and uh, that's why he was uh, giving the Henry Friesen lecture today as part of the Friends of CIHR, uh, Dr. Lauren Tyrell, uh, an icon of Canadian science. Thanks for joining us. Well, today. it's humbling to see previous winners and to such an honor to be recognized with the Henry Friesen Prize. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank it's you. Wonderful meeting you too. Great. It's a wrap. <laughs>